Hello grade 10s, in this video we will be looking at some algebra, past paper practice, I'll be doing an exam, we'll be looking at things like factorizing, simplifying, and solving, including inequalities and simultaneous equations. So I hope you stick around for the whole video. Remember to subscribe, please, for more videos like this in the future. Let's jump right in. Starting with factorizing, now as soon as the question says factorize fully, I want you to stop and I want you to think of the different types of factorizing that you should have learned about. We've got highest common factor, which includes taking out a common bracket. We've got difference of two squares. We've got trinomials. And we've also got grouping, which can be kind of grouped with highest common factor, stuff like that. So every time you start a factorizing question, I want you to first try and see if you can take out a highest common factor. If that doesn't work, then we move on to the next type of factorizing. So if we look at 1.1.1, for example, we've got 4x minus x cubed. There's two terms over here. That's my first term. That's my second term. And if you want to take out a highest common factor, you ask yourself, what can I divide each term by? What can I take out of each term? What does each term have in common? So they both have x's in them. The rule is you always take out the variable with the lowest exponent when you're doing highest common factor. So 1.1.1, the thing that you take out, your highest common factor is x. Then you open up your leftover bracket. I call it a leftover bracket. And what you can do is you can say, okay, these two, there's two ways to think about it. You can say 4x divided by x. What does that leave me with? It leaves me with 4. Another way that I tell my students to think about it is what must I multiply x by to get this first term? So we need to multiply x by 4 to get 4x. And then you do the same, but with the second term. So you can either say x cubed divided by x leaves me with the negative x squared, or once again, you can ask yourself, what must I multiply x by my common factor? What must I multiply this by? So if this wasn't here and we're trying to figure it out, what must I multiply x by to get the second term? And then you can figure out, okay, cool, I must multiply x by x squared, because when you multiply and the bases are the same, you add the exponent. So the one plus the two, that's where the three comes from. I hope that makes sense. Then something else that a lot of students do incorrectly is they might do highest common factor, they might do it correctly like I've done it here, and then they move on. But you always need to look inside the brackets and see if you can factorize more. The, the question says uh, factorize fully, and we must always factorize fully. So if you look inside the brackets, I hope that you recognize that this is a difference of two squares situation. So I have a checklist in my head that I go through to check if it is difference of two squares. We've got two terms. We've got a minus in between, square numbers, in other words, I can square root four and it doesn't give me a decimal, and even exponents, two is an even number. Then I know it's difference of two squares. And if I have difference of two squares, you carry down the x, this bracket becomes two new brackets. Difference of two squares is plus in the one, minus in the other, doesn't matter which way. And then you say, what is the square root of four? Two, so two goes there, two goes there, and it makes sense. Because if you had to multiply it out, 2 times 2 gives me 4. So you can always distribute or um, expand to check your answer. And then you can take the square root of x squared. And you should know that the square root of x squared, the square root and the square cancel, leaves me with x and x. Now I have factorized fully. So you get one mark for each of these steps. If we look at 1.1.2, we've got x squared plus 15x minus 54. Always try highest common factor first, but I can see here that there isn't something that I can take out as a highest common factor. Please look for highest common factor, especially if you have a coefficient of your x squared term over here. But there's no highest common factor. So I've got three terms, so I know it's going to be a trinomial. Now, different teachers teach trinomials in very different ways. So the way that I do it might not be how you were taught. You can stick to your method. I'm just going to go through how I do it. So I'm just going to write the trinomial a bit bigger so everybody can see it quite nicely there. So your first step, well, your answer, when you do a trinomial, your answer is always going to be in two brackets. There's a lot of different methods for finding out what the signs should be in the brackets. Um, one of the ways you can find out the signs is I tell my students first sign in the first bracket, and then a positive times what sign gives me a negative. A positive times a negative gives me a negative. But there are other ways to do this as well, and I will go through that in a second. So, two brackets. 
Don't worry if you don't figure out the signs yet, we can do that later. Then the next thing that you need to do is you need to consider the constant term. So that's the term without any variables like that, 54 in this case, negative 54. And we find the products of 54. So what times what gives me 54? And as a shortcut, you must try and think ahead. We are essentially trying to find the products. So like 1 times 54 or whatever. And the combination of those products, if I add them or if I subtract them, it must give me the middle term. That's kind of what we're dealing with. So I mean, 1 times 54, that is a set of products. So 1 times 54 gives me 54. But 54 and 1, that's not going to give me 15. So this is not helpful. So I've continued to list my products. 2 times 27 gives me 54. I know we're trying to make a negative. I'll get to that in a second. 3 times 18, 54. 6 times 9, 54. But remember, the one that I care about, the one that's going to help me, is if I add them or subtract them, it must give me the middle term. Okay, so 15, positive 15. So 2 and 27, definitely not going to get me 15. 27 plus 2, 27 minus 2, nowhere near 15. If you take a look at 18 and 3, we know that 18 minus 3 gives me 15. So that could be something that could work. However, 9 and 6, that could also give me 15. So now we have to choose between these. And this is where it can get a little bit tricky. So what I want you to do is we need to make sure that we choose a combination that when I multiply them together, it must give me negative 54. When I add and subtract, it must give me positive 15. So for example, you could say, mm, I think if I had to say positive 9 plus 6, what is 9 plus 6? That gives me 15. And yes, I want, if I add them, it must give me the middle term, which it does. But 9 times 6, positive 9, positive 6, positive 9, positive 6 gives me positive 54. And I want a negative. So I know that 9 and 6 is not going to work. And you could say, hmm, what about negative 9 and positive 6? If I multiply those two together, it gives me negative 54. But if I add negative 9 plus 6, that gives me negative 3, not positive 15. I hope you know what I mean. So the 9 and the 6 option is not going to work. So I hope that you realize that it is actually the 18 and the 3 option that works because 18 minus 3, that gives me positive 15. And 18 times negative 3 gives me negative 54. So positive 18 in the one bracket, so x plus 18, and negative 3 in the other bracket, x minus 3. That is basically how I do trinomials. And yes, you can figure out the signs first and then figure out which one should get 3, which one should get the 18, but ultimately you're going to be going through this thought process anyways. And always, to check your trinomial, just distribute. So x times x, x times negative 3, 18 times x, and 18 times negative 3. So do FOIL or distribute. My next question, if you take a look, I've got four terms. So can't take out highest common factor. That's y, that's x, y, x, can't do HCF. Can't do difference of two squares, can't do trinomials. We've got four terms. This is going to be a grouping situation. And what I always tell my students first is try and group the first two terms together and then the next two terms together. Just be careful if this is a positive it does, um, if this is a negative, it's a positive here, so it's fine. But if it's a negative, it becomes a little bit more complicated when you group the last two together. But this is a straightforward or a more straightforward example, although we do have to actually end up doing a sign change. You'll see what I mean. So look at the first two terms. Ignore the last two terms. We're, we're not dealing with that right now. If you look at the first two terms, we've got y and then minus xy. Can I take a highest common factor out of these two terms? Do they have anything in common? Yes, they do. They have a y. So you take the y out, you open the leftover brackets. What is y divided by y? You get 1. Or you could say y times 1 gives you y. Then you do the second term. What is xy? Okay, so it's going to be a negative here. What is xy divided by y? You just left with x. Close your brackets. Remember, you can always check yourself as you're factorizing. y times 1 is y y times negative x is negative xy so we're doing we're doing it correctly so far then 
we can carry down the rate. So you can't take out anything from x and negative 1. <clears throat> so you carry down x minus 1. Now, what is essentially happening is it looks like we have a common bracket scenario going on. So if you look at what we have now, we have two terms. Remember, initially we had four terms. Now this is one term and this is one term. What do they have in common? So what does the first term and the second term have that is in common that I can take out as a highest common factor? The brackets are almost the same. Remember, you can only take it out as a highest common factor if they are identical, but they're not yet. This is one minus x, this is x minus one. So I always tell my students to just check, look at the following. This is a positive one and a negative x in the first bracket. In the second bracket, we have a positive x and a negative one. So what we need to do here is what we call a sign change. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the first bracket the same. I always tend to change the second sign in the second bracket. It just ends up working out nicely most of the time. So what we're going to do is in the first bracket, we had a positive one. In the second bracket, we have a negative one. So I'm going to change that negative one so it becomes a positive one. In the first bracket, we have a negative x. In the second bracket, we have a positive x. So I'm going to change the second bracket so we have a negative x. Basically, what I've done is I've made the brackets look the same. How some teachers show it is they show that they basically, these two things basically switch places. So the one goes to the front, the x goes to the back. Basically, the signs are changing. But because you're swapping the signs inside the brackets, you have to, have to change the sign outside the bracket. So this sign was a positive, it must become a negative. Now, we still have two terms. There's one term, there's the second term, but now the brackets are identical. So we can take the bracket out as a highest common factor. So one minus x. If you divide this first term here, so I'm gonna show you. If you divide this first term here by one minus x, in other words, you take 1 minus x, you take the bracket, you take it out. What are you left with? You're left with y. So in your left of a bracket, you're going to have y for the first term. And then we do the same thing, but for the second term. So here's my second term, negative bracket. If you take this bracket out, yeah, I'm removing it. What are you left with? Negative 1. Yes, because remember, technically, in the second term, it's invisible, but there's a negative 1 in front of this bracket. So if you take the bracket out, if you divide by the bracket, if you remove the brackets, see, I'm blocking the bracket now, what you're left with is negative 1. So in your left of a bracket, you're going to have negative 1. And that is your final answer. And my students often ask me, ma'am, is it fine if we swap the order of the brackets? Yes, perfectly fine. So you get your marks for the following. You get your marks for factorizing, for grouping these two together and taking out y as a common factor then for your sign change, and then for taking out the common bracket. Moving on to 1.2, which is simplifying. Now, remember, when we simplify, the question says simplify. It's not the case in any of these examples, but sometimes if the question says simplify, we may have to factorize first in order to simplify. Okay, not the issue here, but it can happen, for example, if we have something that looks like this. If I had to ask you to simplify this fraction over here, you can't cancel stuff out yet. Because we have two terms at the top, two terms at the bottom, you would first have to factorize the top and the bottom, and then you would cancel and simplify. So just be aware of that in your exam. Here's the answer to that random made up question, by the way, in case you wanted it. 1.2.1, I just wrote the question out a little bit bigger. It says simplify the following expressions fully. Here you have to distribute or expand. So we take the first term in the first bracket, x, and you multiply it by all three terms in the second bracket. That's just the method. That's just how it works. So you go x times x squared is x cubed. Remember, when you are multiplying, because that's what we're doing when we're distributing, when we're expanding, we're multiplying. When you're multiplying and the bases are the same, x and x, what do you do to the exponents? You add them. So it's x to the power of 1, x to the power of 2. That's where x to the power of 3 comes from. So x times x squared is x cubed. Then, so we did that times that. We've done that. Then x times negative x is negative x squared. Again, adding the exponents. And then x times positive 3, positive 3x. But then you're not done. 
what you've done so far is you've taken the first term in the first bracket and multiplied it by all three terms. Then you have to do the same thing, but with the second term in the first bracket. You have to multiply that by that, then that, and then that. Right. So 2 times x squared, 2x squared. We did that one. 2 times negative x, negative 2x. 2 times 3, positive 6. Now we're not done. We've expanded. Now we need to simplify. This is when you group and add or subtract the like terms. So there's no other cubes. So x cubed, the only x cubed, stays x cubed. We've got negative x squared plus 2x squared. We've got 1x squared or just x squared. Then we've got 3x minus 2x. So 3 minus 2, we've got 1x and then plus 6. That's your final answer. 1.2.2, we are subtracting two fractions. Now, if we're adding or subtracting fractions, just like if you think of a normal fraction. So if I have, say, for example, 2 over 3 plus 5 over 6, we cannot add those yet because the denominators are different. So our first step would be to get them over the same lowest common denominator. So you would have to change this, the LCD, the smallest number that they can both, 3 and 6, can both divide into is 6. So you would have to change this denominator to 6 first. You would say 3 times 2 gives me 6. So 2 times 2 is 4. Then you can add them. So denominators are the same. You keep the denominator. So you keep it as 6. The LCD, you keep the LCD. And you say 4 plus 5, which is 9. And this is just written as an improper fraction. So that is the method when we're adding or subtracting fractions. Get the LCD, write both fractions over the LCD, keep the LCD, and then we add or subtract the numerators. We don't drop the LCD. We don't get rid of it. We only do that when we're solving and there's fractions involved. So we're going to apply that same rules, the same steps. But now we're dealing with fractions that have algebra in them. So step one, find the lowest common denominator. If you have x plus 3, that's two terms here. We have 2 minus x. The LCD, the lowest common denominator, has to include both of these, x plus 3 and 2 minus x. Now, some people don't like the fact that it's 2 minus x. They want it to be x minus 2. So what you can do is you could do a sign change here. Remember, then you would swap the 2 and the x, but then you would have to change that to a positive. You can do that. I'll show you that option of the memo afterwards, but it's not necessary. You don't need to do it. So LCD is this. It has to be something that both of these can divide into. Therefore, it has to include both of them. So essentially what you have now is both fractions. I'm going to put the minus there. Both fractions need to be written over the same lowest common denominator being that you can already combine them into one fraction i'm just going to leave it like this for now so you need to now ask yourself how do i make this denominator look like this denominator it already includes one of the brackets so what you would need to do is you would need to multiply x plus 3 by 2 minus x what you do to the bottom you need to do to the top so you multiply the top by 2 minus x. I'm going to do this slowly, baby steps, just so we don't make a mistake. So you're multiplying 5 by 2 minus x. I'm going to keep the 5 outside the brackets, 2 minus x like that inside the brackets. Same thing with the other fraction. It already has the 2 minus x. It already has that part of the denominator. So that means you must times the bottom with x plus 3. What you do to the bottom, you must do to the top. So you times the top by x plus 3. So you're going to have 3x plus 3. Now what you can do is because they're over the same denominator, we can combine them into the same fraction. Just like we did with that simple um, example before this. So like if we had 5 over 6 plus 3 over 6, for example, they're over the same denominator over here. So we can keep the denominator. You just have to write it once and you say 5 plus 3 is 8. That's basically what we're doing here. So just keep that in mind. And what we can do is, okay, so we've got 5, 2 minus x. Then we've got minus 3x plus 3. 
This is very important because that minus technically belongs to the three. It needs to be the minus three as a whole is going to be distributed into this bracket. The minus three as a whole is going to be distributed into this bracket. Very, very, very important. So like I said, the next step, simplify the numerator, add, subtract, collect like terms. But first we need to distribute the five into the first bracket, the negative three into the next bracket. So five times two is 10, five times negative x, negative five x. Then remember it's negative three times x, negative three x, negative three times three, negative nine. We put that all over the LCD. We don't ever really distribute or simplify or you know multiply out the LCD. Keep it like that. Then you do like terms. So we've got 10 minus nine is one. Then you've got minus five minus three, which is negative eight x. There we go. Keep the LCD the same. We only really ever simplify or distribute the numerator. So that is one version of how your answer can look. So looking at the memo, this is the option that I did. And where do you get your marks? You get marks for your LCD. So this bottom piece here, your numerator, and then your answer. Here's an alternative answer. Still correct. You'll see it looks slightly different because this, there's been a sign change. So what they did here is instead of x, 2 minus x, they wanted it to be x minus 2. So in other words, a positive x and a negative 2. So they swapped the 2 and the x, but because they did that, they had to change the sign here in front of the fraction to a positive. Then the LCD was slightly different, but there was a positive up here. So it makes the answer look slightly different. It's the same answer, just there's been a sign change. 1.2.3 is dealing with exponents. Now we have to simplify this, but we can see that the bases of these things are all different. We've got a 25 here, we've got 15, we've got three and five. We need to simplify. Your first step that you should always do when you have a question like this is try and write your numbers as products of their prime factors. So write the bases as products of their primes. So instead of 25, you can write, and you can take your calculator if you forget how to do this, you say 25 equals, so I'm pressing 25 on my calculator, I'm pressing equals, then I'm pressing shift, that button up here, shift, and then I'm pressing a button that says fact. So I'll show you what that looks like now on my calculator. It's shift, we all know where the shift button is, it's up there. And then the fact button, if this will focus, the fact button, it says fact there. I don't know if you can see it, it says fact. And look what it does, it says five to the power of two. So basically, instead of writing 25, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite that as 5 to the power of 2. Just be careful when you do this, because 25 has an exponent of negative x. So when I rewrite 25 as 5 to the power of 2, I'm going to put it in brackets. And that whole thing in brackets needs to have an exponent of negative x. Okay, all I've done is I've changed the 25 to 5 to the power of 2. It's the same thing. Then you do the same thing, but with 15. So you take your calculator, type 15 equals shift fact, and it tells me three times five. This is literally what my calculator shows me. It says three times five. So what you're going to do is in your brackets, instead of writing 15, you're going to write three times five. All of that must be in brackets, and it must be raised to the power of x plus one, because initially 15 was raised to the power of x plus 1. So both of these must be raised to the power of x plus 1. Then 3 is already a prime number. I'm going to leave it like that. 5 is already a prime number. I'm going to leave it like that. That's step 1. Then your next step is you need to do power, what I call power inside times power outside. So if you have here, this is a base raised to this exponent, and then there's another exponent outside the bracket. The rule is you multiply the powers, you multiply the exponents. So what I mean by that is you say five, then you say two times negative x. So it's negative two x. Then you do the same with the three and the five. Now this is where a lot of my students make a mistake. Three has an exponent of one. Five has an exponent of one. So what I mean is there's an invisible exponent of one, there's an invisible exponent of one. We need to multiply this exponent by both of these. 
you also need to multiply this exponent by both of these. It's super, super important that you don't make this mistake or the mistake of not doing this. So what would your answer or what would your next step look like then? It would be three to the power of what is one times x? x, what is one times one? Plus one. Then five, what is one times x? x, what is one times one? Plus one. Put that all over three to the power of x times five to the power of minus x. We are not done. We need to continue. I'm going to take this over to another sheet so that we can start there. A lot of my students also stop here. How do you know that you're not done? You know that you're not done because look at the top of the fraction. We have five, we have five. We can put those together. Also, if you look top to bottom, we have threes, we have threes. We can put those together. We can simplify. We'll have fives and fives. We can simplify. Now, from this point, you can definitely finish this off in one or two more steps. I'm going to go a little bit slower just in case there are people that need me to go a little bit slower to understand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the top level first, and I'm first going to simplify the top. I know that technically I could simplify the fives all together in one step, but I'm just going to do it slowly. So let's just ignore the five at the bottom for now. Look at the fives at the top. If they're on the same level, so the fives are at the top together, it means that we're multiplying them. If the bases are the same, which here, this five, this five, same base. The rule is if the bases are the same and you're multiplying, you keep the base and you add the exponents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this to this. So we've got negative 2x plus x plus 1. I'm adding the exponents. Then because I've only got one three at the top here, I'm going to leave it so long like this. If you look at the bottom, I've got a three to the power of x. I'm going to leave it so long and I've got five to the power of minus x. I know I can do it in one step. I know, I know, but I'm just going a bit slower. So then what I'm going to do is actually simplify this little top piece here. So you've got five to the power of what is negative two x plus x, negative x. And then we've got plus one. And then you've got 3x plus 1 over 3 to the power of x and then 5 to the power of minus x. Right, next step. If they're on different levels, so we have 5 at the top, we have 5 at the bottom, we're dividing, so the fraction line means divide. If we're dividing and the bases are the same, we keep the base, we minus the exponents. So we've got 5 minus x plus 1, then I'm minusing the exponents. So I'm minusing negative x. Just please be aware I'm minusing because it's divide and the exponent is negative. That's why it's minus minus. Then I do the same with the 3. So it's 3 to the power of x plus 1 and I'm minusing this exponent. Then we simplify. So I've got 5 to the power of minus x plus 1 plus x and 3 to the power of x minus x, no more x's, we've just got 3 to the power of 1, same thing here, minus x plus x, no more x's, I've just got 5 to the power of 1, so ultimately I end up with 5 times 3, please simplify all the way, which is 15, and that is my final answer. Now yes, I'm going to go back and show you how you could technically quickly do it in one step. At this point over here, what we could have done instead is we could have said, okay, so these are on the same level, so I must add the exponents. So we go 5 to the power of negative 2x plus x plus 1. This one is at the bottom, so it's on the lower level. So I must minus that exponent. So minus, minus x. Then we do the same things with the 3s. We've got different levels, so I'm dividing, so I must minus the exponents. 3x plus 1 minus x. And then from there, we can quickly get to the following over here, and then we say we've got negative 2 plus 1 plus 1, those cancel. So it's 5 to the power of 1, and same thing here, 1x minus x, those cancel, same answer. Here's quite a nice question, this is kind of like a level 3, 4, you have to think a little bit question. It says determine the value of this expression over here. So 3p plus q squared, if and they give me 9p squared plus q squared is 12. So the value of this expression is 12. 
and PQ is equal to negative three. And now if you look at that, you're like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what to do. My advice is start with this that they gave you. They want the value of this. So 3P plus Q squared, you should know that if you have a bracket that's squared like that, 3P, 3P plus Q squared, if it's got two terms in it, it means that, okay, we write the bracket out twice because the bracket is squared. And then we can do the method. Some teachers call it FOIL. It's distributing, it's expanding. So we go 3P times 3P, that's 9 p squared remember three times three nine p times p p squared three p times q that is three p q then you multiply these two together q times three p three p q and you'd multiply q and q q and q is q squared and you might be thinking okay cool ma'am what does that help me i just distributed i just multiplied it out and now i've got an even bigger mess i hope you understand the distribution by the way so it's the first term there with both in the other brackets second term over here with both in the other brackets and you get this look at this carefully think about what i just gave you here and think about what i gave you here look at what it says here 9p squared plus q squared is 12. 9p squared q squared those things appear here as well. 9p squared, q squared. What that means is, and maybe it's easier if I rearrange it like this. 9p squared, q squared. So I just put these two together, put them next to each other. Didn't really do anything. I just moved it. And then 3pq plus 3pq. What is that? 3pq plus 3pq is 6pq. Still, you might be thinking, I don't get it, ma'am. What are you trying to say? In the beginning of the question, I told you, or we told you that 9p squared plus q squared, this thing, that 9p squared plus q squared, this 9p squared plus q squared is 12. So we're telling you that if you see this, which I do over here, this is equal to 12. And then I also told you that pq is equal to negative 3. Where do you see pq? PQ over here is over here. PQ is negative 3. But here I've got 6 times PQ. So I should have 6 times negative 3. So 12 plus 6 times negative 3. That is basically what I need to work out the value of. So it's 12 minus 18 basically, which is negative 6. So the answer to this is negative 6. Negative 6. That's the value of that according to what they've given me. Moving on to solving. We are solving for x. Remember, solving means we want to get x alone. We want to get an answer for x. So x equals something. Now, in this one, it looks a little bit difficult because they're not giving me any numbers or whatever. They're saying px, so let me rewrite it a bit bigger, plus qx equals a. You might be looking at that and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. There's x here. There's x here. x is in both terms. There's two terms. So let's factorize. If you see something like that, think highest common factor. Think factorize. So here's one term. Here's one term. What can, do they have in common that I can take out? They have x in common. What's left over from the first term? So px divided by x is p. Then qx divided by x is q. Close your brackets. So check if you're right. Remember, just multiply out. See if it um, gets back to where you started, which it does. So we know we did it correctly equals a remember solving is getting x by itself how do we get x by itself over here this is x times this bracket so we must divide by the bracket so if we timesing by the bracket here to get rid of the bracket we divide by the bracket on both sides basically what we're doing is we're doing this we're dividing by the bracket here we're dividing by the bracket here like that you don't need to put the bracket there but those brackets cancel out so you're left with x x is equal to a over p plus q. And just by the way, I hope this makes sense that the bottom of the fraction, you guys should know that the bottom of the fraction cannot equal zero because if we divide by zero, we get undefined. So the bottom of the fraction cannot equal zero. And the only way that that would happen is if p and q are the same thing. So pretend p is two. If p is two and, well, actually p cannot equal negative q. 
So they can't be additive inverses of each other. So think about it like this. If P is 2 and Q is negative 2, so I'll just move myself so you can see. If P is 2 and Q is negative 2, what is 2 plus minus 2? 0. The bottom cannot be 0. So uh, what you should actually do, but if you don't, we don't penalize you. But what you should actually do is you should say that P cannot equal to negative Q or Q cannot equal to negative P. If you don't say that, it's still fine, though. You'll get your marks for factorizing here and for your answer. In 2.1.2, we have a quadratic equation. We have x squared. So three terms equal to zero. The question will say solve for x. We cannot do anything here. So normally when we do equations like you did in grade 8 or grade 9, we would get the x's on the one side and then the non-x's or the non-variables on the other side and you would solve. But here we've got a squared. And it's not as simple as having something like this. In grade 8 or grade 9, we did deal with squares, but we would have something like this. Like that. And you would say, okay, cool, we can square both sides. So you square root the left-hand side, you're left with x. You square root the right-hand side, you're left with plus minus 4. Okay, it's not that easy here because we don't just have x squared on the one side. We have three terms here. So this uh, equation is going to have two solutions. And what you should have learned is if you see something like this, you need to factorize. So we need to factorize, get two brackets equal to zero, and then solve from there. How do we factorize this? 2x squared minus 5x plus 2. We're going to have to do a trinomial. You can't take out a highest common factor. So always try and take out a highest common factor first. So you might think, oh, we can take out a 2. Here's a 2, here's a 2, but we can't take a 2 out of 5. There will be a leftover, there'll be a remainder, there'll be a decimal. So we can't do that. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do a trinomial. Now, when you're dealing with a trinomial where there's a coefficient of x squared, different ways to teach this once again. And I teach it probably very different to anything that your teachers have done. So I'm going to show you my method and I basically use a shortcut or like a cheat method. What I do is as follows. It's very to do a trinomial like this where there's a coefficient of x squared. It just, it's tough. So what I do in my cheat method is as follows. And the first thing that I want to say is obviously when you do a trinomial, your answer is going to exist in two brackets. That is your answer. Your answer is going to be two brackets equals zero. So what we do on the side of our page, this is what me and my students do, is we call it the cheat method. We say cheat. And then what we do is as follows. So I'm going to write the trinomial again, like it's given to me on the page. How this method works is as follows. It's difficult to factorize when there's something in front of the x squared. So what we do is we steal the two away from the front of the x squared. We take it away. So we just left with x squared. We steal it away, and because we've stolen it away, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the constant term by that number. So we say x squared minus 5x. So then we're going to say we stole this 2 away, you multiplied by that 2. So we say plus 4. Okay? Then what we do is we factorize this trinomial like normal. So how would we do this? It would be 4 is 1 times 4, or 2 times 2. We want to make a negative 5, so it's going to be 1 and 4 because negative 1 and negative 4. What's negative 1? Minus 4. That gets me negative 5. And what is negative 1 times negative 4? Positive 4. So remember, when you add or subtract, it must give you the middle term. So I'm saying minus 1 minus 4. It gives me the middle term, negative 5. And when you multiply them together, negative 1, negative 4, it must give me the last term. Okay, cool. So we know that our brackets will look like this. x minus 1 x minus 4. However, this trinomial that we factorize over here, this one over here, x squared minus 5x plus 4 is not the original. Remember, we stole the 2 away in the beginning. We took it away, so we left with x squared, and we multiplied this 2 here by this 2 here to get the 4. Because we stole that 2 away in the beginning, we have to put it back. So what I mean by that is put the 2 back in front of the x in both brackets like that then what we do is you try and look in each bracket and see if you can factorize so can i take out anything from the first bracket no it's just 2x minus 1 can i take anything out of the second bracket this one here yes i can take out a 2 so what we do is you can take a 2 out what's left over from the first term x 
what's left over from the second term minus two. What we write here in our answer is just what's in the two brackets. So 2x minus 1 and x minus 2. Now, I know that this is not the way that most people would have learned how to do trinomials where there's a coefficient of x squared. It's just the way that I do it. It's the way that I do it with my classes. We practice this a lot. They like this method. They prefer this to the other methods. So if you've been taught another method and you prefer that method, please, please, please stick with it. It is the method that you learn in class will obviously be the easier method to you. So if I have to show my students, for example, if we have to start doing the textbook method, they'll hate it because I've showed this to them, we've practiced it and they love it. So you stick with what you know. If you want to go over this method again, just rewind this part of the video, watch it again. I promise you, if you don't know how to do trinomials at all and you're learning something from scratch, this is not a bad method. How do you check, by the way, if I've done that correctly? Multiply out the bracket. So you go 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times negative 2, negative 4x. Negative 1 times x, negative x. Negative 1 times negative 2, positive 2. If you simplify that, it gets me back to where we started. So I know that I did it correctly. Cool. So that's the way that I do it. Again, if you want to see that again, just rewind the video, watch it again. But the point is we need to solve. We're not done. So what I tell my students, if they're going to use my cheat method, they must just draw a line through it in their test. The only thing that I want here is the two brackets and the stuff that goes in the two brackets. So this two that we took out here, not part of the answer, just the two brackets. Okay, cool. Then. When you have one term, now technically this is all one term, this whole thing. I know it's two brackets, but it's one term. We take each bracket, we make it equal to zero. We make this bracket equal to zero, solve for x. Make that bracket equal to zero, solve for x. Our solution is going to have two, well, we're going to have two solutions. We're going to have two answers. So this is what it'll look like. You say 2x minus 1 equals zero. You put or in the middle, x minus 2 equals zero. Solve each little equation. Take the minus 1 over, it becomes plus 1. This is times 2 over here. We must divide by 2. So I just solved this little equation. Now I must solve this equation over here. It's minus 2 on this side. Take it over, it becomes plus 2. Essentially what you're saying is that if I have to have x as being 2, if you put 2 over there, you'll get 2 times 2, which is 4 minus 1, which is 3. But if you put 2 over here, 2 minus 2 is 0. Anything multiplied by zero is zero. So the equation will work. It'll be true for both of these answers. Our next one is an exponential equation. How do I know that? Look at where x is. X is up here in the exponent. So the rule is when you're doing exponential equations, and there's more than one way to solve this, but when you're doing exponential equations, my rules are get the bases the same. And when the bases are the same, we can get rid of the bases. So a um, basic example, if we have something that looks like this. Exponential equation, I just made that one up. It's not related to the past paper. Um, exponential equation, x is in the exponents. You need to get the bases the same. So this side is 2 to the power of x. This side here, we're going to have 2 to the power of 4. Because 2 to the power of 4, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So 16 is 2 to the power of 4. Once the bases are the same, so 2 and 2, same base, you drop the base, you got x is equal to 4. So that's basically what we're going to be doing in this example, but the one in the exam paper here is a little bit more difficult. So what I would do, there's two different ways, I'll do both. This way is, okay, this is a half 3x plus 1. What I'm going to do is 32, type it into your calculator, 32 equals shift fact, the same thing I taught you earlier we get 2 to the power of 5, okay? Now, look at the left-hand side. Our base is a half. On the right-hand side, our base is 2. They're not the same. But what I can do is I can do the following. I can rewrite this base as 2. So how it works is as follows. If you have a half like this, let me just show you simple. If you have a half like that, the 2 at the bottom has an exponent of 1. That makes sense. 1 over 2 is a half. If you take this upstairs, the exponent changes sign. So that moves up to the top. So it's 2. It was to the power of 1. It is now to the power of negative 1. Technically, you can write it over 1. Technically, technically, we're flipping the fraction, but that's basically how it works. So if you had to have something like this, 
1 over 3 to the power of 2. If you take that 3 upstairs, it goes like this. This goes up there. It'll be 3 to the power of negative 2. Hope that makes sense. That's just the rule with exponents. So what I'm basically going to do is this 2 over here is an exponent of 1. I'm going to bring it to the top of the fraction. So it's going to be 2 to the power of negative 1. And all of that has this power, this exponent. 3x plus 1. 2 to the power of 5. Cool. So all I've done is I've brought the 2 upstairs, changed the exponent to a negative. Because when it moves up or when it moves down, the exponent changes sign. The exponent, not the base. So not the sign here in front. The sign here in front stays positive. It's the exponent that changes signs. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to write it a bit bigger so you can see because it's very small there. But basically what I have is this. That. What I'm going to do in my next step is I am going to distribute. I'm going to do power inside times power outside. But because there's two terms outside, this is kind of similar to the um, exponents thing we did earlier. It's negative 1 times 3x, so it's 2 to the power of negative 3x. And negative 1 times positive 1, so negative 1 equals 2 to the power of 5. So we basically distribute and multiply out that exponent. It's an exponent rule. Um, when you have a power and then another power, you must multiply those together. Now, are the bases the same? Yes. That's 2. That's 2. So once the bases are the same, we drop them. Then what's left over over here? Negative 3x minus 1. What's left over over here? 5. What I do now is solve like normal. So I've got negative 3x, then 5, plus 1. You take the minus 1 over, becomes plus 1, is 6. This is times negative 3. Opposite of times negative 3, divide by negative 3. So x is negative 2. That is your answer over there. 2.2, we've got an inequality. So this is still part of equations. We're still solving. We're solving for m. So we want to get m by itself. But now m is stuck here in the middle of an inequality. So we've got 3m minus 8 is greater than or equal to negative 11. And 3m minus 8 is less than 4. How we solve inequalities is as follows. So I'm going to rewrite it just so it's a little bit bigger. I've got negative 11. That 3m minus 8. How we do it is as follows. Look at the inside of the inequality. 3m minus 8. We want to get the m by itself. How do we usually do that in equations? So if we have 3m minus 8 and it's equal to whatever, 0 pretend, whatever. How do we usually get the m by itself? We first get rid of the minus 8. How do you get rid of a, a subtract 8? Minus 8, you add 8. So when you do inequalities, you need to, if you add 8 on this side, it's going to get rid of that. So that's going to go. But then you have to add 8 on both of the other sides of the equation. So we've got negative 11 plus 8, and that is negative 3. So on this side, we've got negative 3. We're adding 8 on this side. And then 4 plus 8, we're adding 8 on the other side as well. And we've got 12. Now what we have left in the middle is 3m. Okay, we, remember, we've added 8 to all three parts of the equation. Now, this is times 3. We need to divide by 3. So we're dividing by 3 here, but we have to divide by 3 on all parts of the equation. So negative 3 divided by 3 is negative 1. 3m divided by 3 is just m. 12 divided by 3 is 4. And that's it. Now, just remember, it wasn't the case in this example, in this exam. But if you divide by negative, here we didn't. We divided by positive. If you divide by negative, the, equal, the inequality signs must fill up. Okay? So if we divided by negative 3, pretend, then in your answer, you would have to flip this inequality sign and flip this inequality sign. But that wasn't the case in this one. Then in 2.2.2, they say hence. When they say hence, they mean like based on your previous answer or referring to your previous answer. Write down the number of integers that satisfy the inequality. So how many integers fall in this inequality? So they say m is bigger than or greater than or equal to negative 1, which means that m can be negative 1, but less than 4. So not equal to 4. So m can't be 4. It can be bigger than 1 but less than 4. So it can be negative 1, it can be 0, it can be 1, 2, and 3. It can't be equal to 4. So that's 1, 
two, three, four, five. Five integers satisfy the inequality. Our last question for this algebra section of this paper was solve simultaneously for x and y. So we use simultaneous equations or solving simultaneously when you have two equations and you have two variables. So you need to look for x and you need to look for y. There's different methods when it comes to simultaneous equations. You get elimination, you get substitution. I'm going to be doing substitution in this question. You might have done something else with your teacher. You may have done elimination, but I'm going to do substitution. So I hope that you follow along and that it makes sense. Um, let's go. So I have two equations. When you do substitution, your goal is to pick an equation. So this is equation number one. This is equation number two. Choose a variable and you're going to make that variable the subject of the equation, which means you're going to get it alone on one side of the equation. I think in the strategy that works the best when you do this is try and isolate a variable that when you isolate it, you're not creating a fraction. You can work with fractions if, if you want, but it's easier to not work with fractions. So what I mean is let's take equation number two as an example. If I were to take equation two, this is 2x equals 3 minus y. And I have to say, okay, cool. I'm going to isolate a variable. I'm going to get x by itself. How would you get x by itself here? This is times two. You would have to divide by two. That's actually not too bad. You would have to divide this by two. So it'd be three over two. And you would have to divide this by two. Now x is by itself. It's not the best one to have isolated because we have fractions and fractions do make life a little bit more complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same equation, this one, but I'm going to make y the subject of the equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that y is standing alone on by itself, just y, not negative y, just y. So how I do it is as follows. Negative y, I'm going to take it over. It's going to become positive y. 3 is going to stay by itself over here. And then this is positive 2x. It's going to come over. It's going to become negative 2x. Remember, I'm using simplified language here when I'm speaking, just for the sake of not taking too long when explaining. But what you're doing is doing inverse operations. So subtracting y is the opposite of adding y. So when it goes across the equal sign, you do inverse operations. So this is plus 2 adding 2. We're basically minusing by 2x on both sides. That's where the negative 2x comes from. But we just simplify when we speak about it. So I took the minus y over, it becomes plus y. The 3 stayed over here, so it stays positive 3. Took the plus 2x over, it becomes negative 2x. So what I've done is I haven't changed the equation. This, this one here, and this, it's the same thing. It's just that I've made y the variable, the, the subject. Okay. So what I'm going to do is because I've done that, I'm just going to ignore version one of the equation. This is my one equation and this is my other equation. Now, what you do in order to solve simultaneously is see here that I tell you that y is equal to three minus two x. So I'm telling you that everywhere where you see a y, everywhere where you see a y in the place of y, we can put 3 minus 2x because y is equal to 3 minus 2x. So if you look at the second equation, there's a y. In the place of this y, I'm going to use brackets and I'm going to put 3 minus 2x. This is called the substitution method. So basically what we're doing is say this is equation number two, say this is equation number one. We're substituting equation number two into equation number one. You don't even need to write that. You don't even need to understand that sentence. Basically, what we're doing is we're saying we're taking this first equation. So I'm going to rewrite it. Um, let's do it up here. 5x plus 4y equals 21. And everywhere in that equation where you see a y, in the place of y, we're putting 3 minus 2x. So what we do is here we have 5x plus 4, then in the place of y, you use brackets, you put 3 minus 2x. You're basically taking this and you're putting it in the place of this. Okay, equals 21. Then if you take a look at what we've got here, we've got 5x, there's x, there's no more y. 
So what we do from this point onwards is we solve like normal, we solve for x. So how that would work is you say, okay, cool, 5x, then 4 times 3 is 12, 4 times negative 2x, negative 8x equals 21, solve like normal, x is on one side, 5x minus 8x, 21 minus 12, I'm just doing inverse operations, so the 5x and the 8x stayed here, the plus 12, opposite of plus 12, minus 12. So what I've got is I've got negative 3x on this side, 9 on this side. What's the opposite of times negative 3? Divide by negative 3. So that means that x is equal to negative 3. A positive divided by a negative is a negative. So we've already got our one answer. But remember, our question said solve for x and y. So we solve for x. Now it's as simple as once you have solved for x, take x and put it back into either of your equations. So remember, this was equation number one. I left it as is. Equation number two, I rearranged to look like this. It doesn't matter which one you put x into. Put it into both. You'll see you get the same answer. I'm just going to choose the second equation because it's easier. It's quicker. So you take your answer for x, which is negative three. And in the place of x here, you put negative three. So you'll often see teachers write this sub x equals negative three into equation number two. Again, don't need to write that sentence. So y is equal to three minus two x. That's your equation. In the place of x, we're going to put negative three. So three minus two in the place of x, use brackets. We put negative three because x is equal to negative three. So it's three. What's negative two times negative three? Positive six. So three plus six, nine. So now we've got our bo both of our answers, x is negative 3 and y is 9. And you have solved simultaneously. I know that this was a very long video, but we worked through an entire part of a past paper that dealt with algebra. I hope that it's been helpful. Please let me know what you want to see in the comments below. Subscribe for more videos like this. And I can't wait to see you in another one very soon. Bye, everyone.